Hello. Every Haskell programmer in one of the first days or weeks usually learns about the fold R function, which is a function that captures uh, the recursive pattern of functions that operate on lists. But not quite as many Haskell developers know about unfold R, which is a counterpart that allows you to generate lists. And in this very first episode of our show, we want to look at the unfold R function, look at its definition, its type, and see how we can generate various different lists with it. Yeah, so welcome to the Haskell Unfolder, a YouTube series where we discuss all things Haskell. As always, the show is live streamed, so we invite you to submit questions and comments in the chat, and we will try to show them on screen and discuss them. OK. So let's start by looking at the type. And actually, the, the function exists on the data.list module. And um, the type signature looks actually a little bit strange. And actually, when I, when I first saw this, I was a bit surprised because I thought that in a function about lists, what is this maybe and what is this tuple doing there? And um, let's first see how we can define the function. And then later, towards the end of the episode, we'll actually get back to this question of the maybe type and perhaps see uh, the, the, the deeper reason for why the type signature is as it is. Uh, so I'll, I'll type uh, the type signature in. I'll rename b to s. You can think of the reason for calling it s as like this is some form of state or seed. Um, and uh, and uh, we take a generator function, which from such a, a seed value produces a, a maybe of a pair of an a and an s. And then we take another s. And from these two things, we can then generate a list of a's. And the first fascinating thing is that if we try to define this function, it's one of these functions where, I mean, it's not completely determined by the type, but there is not very much we can do but to implement unfold R if we are given this type. If we just look at it, um, we have two arguments. So let's call this function gen for generate, and let's call this value of type SS. And we need to produce a list of A's. But the only way we can possibly get A's is here out of this maybe, right? So if we like want to do anything interesting and not just always produce the empty list, we need a's from somewhere. So we have to apply this function. In order to apply this function, we need an s. We have exactly one s, which is this one. So we like there is really not much we can do except apply gen to s and then look at the result. And we get either nothing or we get just of um, a pair, right? Let's call this a and s prime. Now, if we have nothing, we still have to produce a list of A's, but we don't have any A's. So really, the only thing we can do is to produce the empty list. And in the just case, we do have an A. And OK, there is a little bit of a choice here, but it's a relatively obvious thing to use it as the first element of our list that we're producing. And then we have to do something. and. Well, here perhaps there is a little bit of creativity in there, but we can recurse with the same generator function and the new seed value. And that's it. That is our definition of unfold R. So I, I hope that makes sense. But of course, it hopefully becomes clearer if we look at the first example. And the first example that we want to look at, I mean, for inspiration, we can look at functions that are in the prelude or in the list library. Uh, that are lying around that generate lists. And one of these functions is enum from two, which um, probably, like most of you, are not using all that often directly, but it is used indirectly if you're using the list range syntax. So whenever you type something like 1.10, what actually gets executed behind the scenes is enum from two, from 1 to 10. And this is a list generation function that we can easily write using unfold r. So let's let's try to do this. Let's try to write enum from two. And um, I'll like simplify the type signature somewhat and pretend that we're only working on integers. Uh, so we have a lower and an upper bound, and we want to produce a, a list of integers. And so let's call this one low and this one high. 
we want to write this as an unfold R. And so we need two arguments. And now here, it like it, the idea is, right, we are generating the elements in order. So, so the seed value or the state value, it makes sense to like keep the upper bound there, sorry, the, the lower bound as the, as the seed value, because we're starting from there. And once we have produced like the lowest possible element, we can move on to the next one. So, so this, this works out nicely if we, if we start with this. And then here we have a function that gets the current value. Right? And then we check whether the current value is larger than the upper bound. And if it is, then we're done. And we're indicating that we're done by producing nothing. And otherwise, we are um, producing the current value as the next value of our output list. And we are incrementing the state by one. So basically, we're continuing recursively with car plus one. But we no longer are explicitly recursive. Um, oh, You're missing a bracket. Missing a, a parenthesis there, yeah. We are no longer explicitly recursive because the recursion is exactly what is being captured by unfold R. Right? So this um, should hopefully produce the same result if I reload here and call enum from two prime from one to 10, I get the same thing. And just like the normal function does, if I if I have a situation where I start with a larger number um, than the upper bound, then I get an empty list, and that tends it also behaves like the uh, the standard Haskell version of this function. So this is an example where the seed or the state or whatever you want to call it, right, appears in the list itself, right? We are we're including mm -hmm. the seed in the list. Perhaps yeah. it would be interesting to see an example where that is not the case. Yes, um, let's think about this. So perhaps we can do, um, I mean, that is a little bit of a contrived example, but I think it is nevertheless interesting. We can try to generate the Fibonacci numbers using unfold R. And that is interesting also in the sense because that will be generating an infinite list. Um, so, so we want to generate all the Fibonacci numbers. And um, so if we try to write this as an, as an unfold R. We again need two arguments. And uh, so here we are going to use as state a pair of two numbers, right? That is uh, sort of like, I mean, the, the idea of the Fibonacci numbers is that you're, you're starting with two numbers. Usually you start with one and one or with zero and one. And then the next number is always the sum of the two previous numbers. And so you always just have to remember the previous two numbers right, in order to generate the next one. There's nothing more that you need. So we start with zero and one, let's say, okay. And then in the function case, we get our two numbers, like let's call them X and Y, okay. And here we always produce a new element, right, because it's an infinite list. So there is no way we ever produce nothing. So we just say just, and the new element let's say is the first element of the pair. And then we have to change the state, right? And here we have to put a new pair. And so we use the second component of the original pair as the first component of the new pair and the sum of the two previous numbers as the new thing. And so here now we have a situation where the state type is really different from the element type of the lists. And even though, yeah, components of the state are still appearing in the output list, it is uh, nevertheless um, uh, sort of like different. And I hope that uh, kind of shows the answer. Oh, there is still, um, and like I'm bad at parentheses today. So, okay, <laughs> Same let's see, let's try um, like in case I made a mistake, let's try uh, like with just the first 10, but this looks plausible. And then we should be able to go a little bit further and take like the first 50. So Fibonacci numbers grow very quickly. Um, but this is a, like an efficient implementation, right? So you can also write an inefficient recursive definition that just like holds the Fibonacci function recursively at n minus one and n minus two, but that blows up quickly. That is a nice way to 
like make your computer produce a lot of heat. Um, but uh, uh, but this one is is actually um, reasonably efficient. Could you show perhaps? I remember when I saw this for the first time, being quite confused by it. Would you be able maybe show the value of x and y at every step as we computed? Maybe like debug. You, you mean you mean just by by tracing or, yeah, yeah, or by tracing, okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? Let's see. Um, so we import debug.trace and then let's see that perhaps here in this, in this place, we could yeah, yeah, yeah. just say trace show of the current pair of X, Y. That's a trace show is a variant for those of you who have not seen this before of trace oh actually here i have to do a trace trace show for it's a variant of trace that that uh, applies the show function and then general trace is sort of a debugging function right that uh, when when this second argument gets evaluated it will also print the the first one effectively to the screen screen so we won't get an extremely nice looking output from this i guess so let if we do again take 10 fits did you reload? Um, a reload, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so it, it's kind of interleaved because it happens during the uh, lazy evaluation of the rest, right? But uh, but we can see that, uh, yeah, always in order to print one list element, we also have to print one pair and the pair shifts along. So we start with zero, one, then the next pair is one, one, then the next pair is one, two, and then it's two, three, then it's three, five, and so on. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to okay. remind people, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we can, we can, uh, discuss them, but if there are no, I mean, that's totally fine, of course, but <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the, this is perhaps all relatively easy for many people who have been like using Haskell a lot already, but, um, like, and on the other hand, if you're just starting with it, uh, these these kind of functions like also fold r and unfold r they can be um already quite miraculous so um so uh, yeah so let's let's look at more examples perhaps i mean um yeah i remember when you showed this to me first you showed me an example where actually unfold worked quite well and where it didn't work quite well i thought those were quite nice perhaps we could look at those too yeah, so, okay, let's, I mean, so one, one interesting thing is that if you have functions that go from lists to lists, say map, right? I mean, map, um, or again, I call this map prime so that I don't have to hide the prelude version and can still uh, compare with that one. So um, if, we, if we look at map, map takes a list and it produces a list. And map actually can be very nicely written as a fold R, but it can also be written as an unfold R. It also produces a list, and you can also take that viewpoint. And it's not particularly difficult to write it that way. So here we can actually use the list itself as the state. So I mean, we could write unfold R and then something excess, or we can like eta reduce, as it's called, and even just remove the second argument and just see like map prime f is is a partially applied unfold r and that then is a function from a list to a list and here then we have a list we get a list and if we do um oh. yeah, so just analysis, clear, the, this, the state of this unfold now is the input list perhaps i should keep it i mean it's not not a this is just cute of course if you've seen this multiple times then it's like um, very easy to do this kind of eta expansion, eta reduction, as it as it's often called. But like um, like if a if a function has a final argument that is used nowhere else but in the final position on the right hand side, and you can you can uh, uh, like omit it on both sides, and you can think about can, can think it through and can see that it amounts to the same thing. But we can leave it there for explicit. Um, uh, for the explicit that's really uh, for now yeah um so let's say we have these two cases if we have the empty list then we also want to produce the empty list but we are producing the empty list in unfold r by producing nothing right by saying nothing here and um if we 
um, have a y cons y s. We also produce uh, an element, but the element we're producing is not y, it is f applied to y. So we are saying just of f applied to y, and then the new state is y s. Okay, and that is the definition of map. So let's compare. This is the prelude version of map, and this is the this is our version of map. Um, that is um, that is fine. So um, so this this works for some functions, but now you can you can become bold and you can say, okay, well after map there is always filter. And um, the filter is A to bool to list of A to list of A. So perhaps we can write filter as an unfold R as well. And that is an example of a function that is not so easy to write using unfold R. Um, so not everything, like just, I guess, for fold R, you can take the viewpoint that everything can, in principle, be expressed using fold R. Um, because, like, in principle, if you go to, uh, like, Great lengths and, and possibly um, like uh, encode your your uh, your function in the right way. Then almost uh, basically every list function is uh, list consuming function is expressible. For unfold R, I actually have to think about it. I think basically the same thing holds, but that doesn't mean that it is nice, right? That doesn't mean that it is in any way nice. It can get like extremely ugly, and you should certainly not use unfold R in situations where it is extremely ugly. You should perhaps use it in situations um, where it is relatively obvious. Um, and here, yeah, we see that it, like filter is already a case where it's not so clear. Uh, so if we try a similar thing as in the situation of map, we get into into this situation, right? Um, so we, we again we try to use the, the list as the state. Um, but now, if we do a similar approach, well, we can start and have a case distinction here, and also say if we have an empty list to filter, then uh, clearly we are producing the empty list. And if we have a y cons y s, then we are checking whether this uh, function p on y is true or false. But now we are getting into slight trouble because if um, if the function is true, then we want to keep the element and then we are good and we can produce just y and go on with ys. But in this else case, none of the two like cases of the maybe type is doing the right thing, right? So if we don't want to stop, we don't want to like uh, say if, if there is one element that, that fails, then we stop. Actually, that is another function. I think it's called take while. So that one would be very easily expressible as an unfold R. I'll leave that as an exercise, right? Um, but um, that filter, which goes on if it finds an, um, an element, is uh, is harder because we we don't have an element to produce in this case. Like what we would like to do is just change the state without producing an element. And so there are multiple ways around this. I mean, either we can call another recursive function on L here in order to basically like look ahead um, uh, up to the first element, which satisfies the condition, right? If there is such a thing, but then we need to write another helper function, which is itself recursive. I mean, that works, we could do it, um, but it is not, not, not as straightforward. Uh, or we could generalize the, the unfold R pattern in a way so that it allows this additional action so that you have one of three options, right? Produce, uh, stop, like, um, like uh, produce the empty list, um, produce an element and change the state or just change the state, skip. And, and actually there are some um, useful uh, variants of, of unfold in, in, in the literature and in circulation that have this extra skip step. If you, if you, if you look a little bit wider, unfold uh, is also used for, uh, for optimization. Um, so so they're like one of the famous applications of fold R is that it is used in fold R build fusion, which is employed by GHC and, uh, and the standard list library. Some Haskell packages are employing another uh, optimization mechanism that is called stream fusion. And stream fusion is in a way based on a, on a version of, of uh, unfold R destroy fusion, 
which is sort of the dual to fold our build fusion. And the versions of unfold are there using, like often have this skip in particular, because you want to be able to, to work with, with filters easily. But but here I'm, I'm basically just stopping here and I'm, I'm, I'm leaving it as an example that cannot easily be expressed using using unfold R if that's, if that's all right. So there are a few questions about yeah. uh, that uh, that I think will be more naturally answered once we start talking about the why unfold R has a type that it has. So perhaps let's let's move towards uh, that. Yeah, um, I mean, one thing that I would have briefly shown would have been to say, like, basically as a counterpart for filter, that filter is a function that produces a list. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah sure. uh, that is uh, mm -hmm. not so easy. I mean, uh, perhaps I should briefly do that, and then we would like yep. go to yeah, this, this yeah, other yeah. thing. Um, so zip is another function which is like common on lists. And zip is another function that produces a list and it also takes lists. And it is perhaps nice to show because while zip is like a list function and also a list processing function, it cannot so easily be written using foldr. Right? It's one of the examples where it becomes a bit awkward because you're, you're running through these two lists at the same time in lockstep. And, and that is a little bit contrary to the whole basic idea of what Foldr is doing. But you're producing this result list in a very straightforward way. And that makes it a natural fit for UnfoldR. So if we um, just um, do this, uh, we use UnfoldR. And I should probably use the prime again and have two things. And um, so here as the state, I'm just going to use the pair of the two lists. And uh, here I get the pair of the two lists. Um, so perhaps, um, yeah, I don't know, L1, L2. I'm, I'm not so happy about the names. But, so perhaps I should just use lambda case, which I, 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 um, uh, let's be explicit here. So, um, so uh, let's look at the, at the two lists. Um, or actually, yeah, no, actually, I don't even need to pat, pat on match on these because I want to do a case analysis on this anyway. So let's just call this S. And then if they're both empty, um, then we want to stop. And if they're both non-empty, then we want to produce a new element, which is the pair of x comma y and continue with the state, which is access from OIS. And then we have these other cases in which we want to stop as well. And I could, could collapse I could collapse this final case with the first one. Perhaps I should. So let's just remove this one because it's subsumed by this last catch-all case. And then we have a version of zip which uh, should work. Like one, two, three, four, five, six um, works as expected. So this uh, this can be very nicely done. But yeah, OK, so in preparation to the questions you mentioned and also in preparation for sort of like um, getting closer to the end, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, like the type um, of, uh, of, of uh, unfold R again. And um, so <clears throat> for this, I think it is interesting to realize how the list type itself is defined because it is related to the fact like how how lists are defined and if we if we would define lists ourselves I mean um, and abstract from all the magic syntax that lists have in Haskell the definition of the list type in Haskell would look something like this and so you would say a list of A's is either the empty list or it is a cons which has two arguments namely the first element of a list and then the tail, which is another list. Right. Now, if you um, define a variant of this type, which is doing exactly the same as the list type, the only difference is we abstract from the recursive positions by introducing a new parameter r. So, and I'm calling this list F because in the literature, this is often called the pattern functor of lists. But um, it, this is like, I mean, but it's a related type to lists, right? It's a, it's a mechanical construction, if you like, that you can produce from the list type. Um, 
Oops, there. Okay. So, so the only change is is this, and and you can like if you if you think about it, list f a of list of a, right, is is more or less the original, like is isomorphic to the original list type again. If you if you fill in list of a into this recursive position here. Then you have something back that is uh, that is uh, close to the original position. But now, if we also look at the list f type that we just defined in a different way and compare it with maybe a comma s, right? If we compare this, these two types, maybe pair of a comma s with this one, then you can also see that they're isomorphic to each other because nothing. We have a case for nothing here, which corresponds to nil f, right? So that has no arguments. And in the case that we have a just here, we have two arguments, namely an A and an S, and that corresponds to the cons F here. So maybe A comma S is more or less the same as list F A as list F A S. So we could relatively easily write a version of unfold R that has this type, list F A S. And I'm not going to do this now um, because I think it is relatively straightforward if you realize that nothing just plays the role of nil f and just plays the role of cons f. Um, but um, but the, the important realization is that this kind of justifies the relation between like why why this maybe type appears here because it's actually sort of the shape of the list type itself only that we've abstracted from the recursive positions. And um, so of course, in a way, it's precisely what unfold is doing as well, right? It's abstracting away from a recursion in a way. And that, yeah, and that is what unfold R is doing as well. And it also establishes the relationship between unfold R and fold R because fold R, the type signature, is something like this: you you have an R and an A and an R and then another R, and then you um, go from um, uh, a list of A's one to a single R. That is the that is the type signature of fold R in Haskell, or R I'm using here for results or something like this. Um, but if you if you look at this, these two arguments here, like the um, uh, R to A to R and the the single R, and if you compare this again, let's put undefined. Um, if you compare this with list f a r to r, then these two are also isomorphic, and that's perhaps a little bit trickier to see. But um, right here, you have two inputs, and here you have just one input function. But if you pass nil f to this function. Right or or nothing, if you like. You could also put maybe a comma r here, right? Um, if you pass nil f to the function, then it you get just a single r value, namely this one, right? You can put this one in. Otherwise, if you put two input values in, you can do exactly what this function is doing. So by pairing these two functions up in the right way, you can turn them into this, and by separating them in the right way, you can go from here to here. So, um, so these two types are also equivalent. And if you compare this and this, they really look very similar, right? They are like categorically dual to each other. You just reverse the arrows, so to speak. But, um, but the important thing is like, yeah, one very systematically destructs a list, the other very systematically constructs a list. They both just abstract from the recursive nature of lists. And you can do the same construction with other data types. All right, this is too far for today's episode, but um, but this shows like the same principle, like what I just did. You start with the list data type and you abstract from the recursive positions. You can do the same thing with other data types. And if you look at a package like recursion schemes, and there are many other packages on Hackage, um, they they do this in the in the general way. They they have sort of a generalization for these kind of recursive patterns. Yeah, so actually that's a nice segue to one of the questions. So if yeah. I can bring it up here, this yep. question from Jeremy Gibbons. Good to have you here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, these days, foldr is no longer simply a list function. It works for anything foldable, but unfoldr is still old-fashioned and generates only built-in lists. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, so fold foldable is one possible generalization of foldr, um, but it is a generalization that 
I think Jeremy would probably agree with me is actually sort of not the interesting one uh, because foldable generate generalizes fold R and also fold L to basically everything that like where you can extract all structures where you can extract the elements in order basically all structures that can be turned into lists right but the um but the uh the other um like sort of the, the the more interesting generalization in my opinion is the one where you make a work on on other recursive data types and um and that is that is harder to capture with a single class in haskell like looking at the the way like sort of subtle restrictions of the haskell type system i mean it's actually the case that the, the standard libraries do contain sort of uh, the, 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 like what this is called the catamorphism for fold R and the anamorphism for unfold R, right? So they do contain various instances of this pattern. So for example, the maybe function, right? Is actually just the sort of the the, the fold or the catamorphism for the maybe type, and uh, and there are there are other examples of this, but it is not so easy to to capture that with a single class and sort of the 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 the, the generalization that foldable does for fold R specifically. I think you could be probably doing something similar for unfold um, by sort of I don't know. I think it's more Generally. difficult right? because it's easy to collapse things to lists, but it's much more difficult to like. Yeah, possibly you could do. Them. Possibly you could basically do something like mon like use the fact that that lists are effectively the free monoid and sort of generalize over monoid and then get something like that. That that might be that might be an idea, but uh, yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, sort of the more, I think the more interesting generalization is sort of the one to catamorphisms and anamorphisms. And, and that isn't really captured by the foldable class. And that might explain why there isn't an, like sort of an unfoldable class. Right. So then I have one other question for you. And I think this one is a little bit more um, uh, less abstract. Uh, and it's an obvious question to ask, right? Like we have fold R and a fold L. Uh -huh. That means that we're going to have an unfold R and unfold L. Oh yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, or well, it's actually a question I kind of expected to occur, and I was thinking about this a bit. So I think it is relatively clear what unfold L would be expected to do, right? So unfold L, you would basically, um, you would start from, uh, like, you would start building the list from the right, and in this case, I really mean like, so basically, the first element you would be generating here would become the last element of the resulting list um it is like it's not i think it's not on lists at least a function that i can imagine being very useful because i don't think there is like sort of a, a substantially better implementation for it than the one that you would be getting by effectively just combining unfold r with reverse um the, I think the, the cool thing about fold L for lists is that there is a substantially better definition for it than perhaps sort of the, the naive speci naively specified one where you have an accumulator and you can kind of run through the list while consuming it and produce a final output. But, um, but yeah, unfold L could be defined in this way. And if you have a sort of a symmetric data structure, like sequences or vectors or something, then unfold L very much makes sense. Like if you like if you want to fill like build a vector by by filling it from the left or filling it from the right and you have random access to the data structure, then then both functions make sense. And I think actually those libraries have it. I like I, I mean, it's just from memory at the moment, but I think if you if you if you look at the vector library or also at data.sequence, I wouldn't be surprised if if these are uh, supplying both unfold R and unfold L. All right. Are there um, any more questions? So, yeah. Um, yeah, well, we have yeah one a comment from someone, so I'll just bring it up and then we'll close after that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So Jason here says that he finds it difficult to um to wrap his head around because it's such a polymorphic type. Um. And actually, just realizing that uh, you could, like, if you're unfolding a list, you could use a list itself, and that actually is uh, is quite useful. So, yeah. Yeah. Let's just me let me make one final remark to this, since you're bringing this up. So, so one of the things why I like unfold is actually not so much even um, 
because you necessarily have to use it, but because also looking at these kind of functions gives you a programming strategy. Like whenever you have a function that operates on a list as input, right? So the, the normal thing you can do in order to make your problem smaller is to do what foldr does, to basically split into two cases, like one for the empty list and one for the non-empty list, and to try to recurse in the, in the non-empty list case. That gives you a strategy and that can help you write the program. Similarly, whenever you have a function that produces a list, an option you have is to think about it in terms of the creation of the result list, to think about like when am I creating the empty list? When am I creating a cons? And that is exactly what Unfold R does. And it's another interesting, valid programming strategy. I think I'll leave it at that for today. We're slightly over time. We have to like calibrate on the upcoming episodes. But, uh, yeah, OK. Yeah, so thanks, everyone, for watching this episode of the Haskell Unfolder. Um, there are some few more questions in the chat. Um, feel free to put them in the comments on the, the video below, and we'll try to answer them there. Um, if you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe, and we'll hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>